Our topic for today is gonna, gonna really develop uh, some of this uh, idea of the QEP. And the passage that I have in mind is yet another passage from the ones that Dr. Bailey mentioned, and it's in James chapter one. And it reads, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their misfortune and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And so half of this equation is the idea of caring for those who are in need. And so today our cultural engagement chapel, because we think this is a form of cultural engagement, is the way we relate to those in need around us, uh, is going to deal with two different areas of ministry. And it's a little unusual to put these two next to one another, but it shows the range of what we're talking about. I've got uh, Angela Nistemski, I've been working all day on that name, okay, um, who graduated in 2007, is that right? Uh, 2008, okay, and you were in the chaplaincy program here at Dallas Seminary? Actually, biblical studies. Biblical mm -hmm. studies, and you ended up in the chaplaincy. Yes. Okay, how'd yes. that happen? <laughs> that is a long story. Okay, we won't go there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and then, and then uh, Wayne Walker graduated in? 07. Oh, Seven. Okay, so there's something going on around here in the mid in the mid aughts that led people to go to seminary and then turn around and end up in the ministries they have. So you serve at Baylor, correct? Yes. yes. And you're involved in a ministry called Our Calling. Uh, people know what Baylor Hospital is. They know what chaplains are. But what in the world do you do, Wayne? <laughs> Our primary focus are those individuals that are not in shelters, the homeless folks that are considered unsheltered. So for every one person in a shelter in Dallas County, there are four that are not. There's about 2,000 shelter beds in Dallas, and even without math classes at DTS, we can figure out that's a lot of people sleeping outside every day. And so our focus is really discipleship, hardcore discipleship with those thousands of people that are outside every day. Now, how did you end up, hopefully this isn't a long story, but how did you end up doing that? Well, to not tell you the long story, <laughs> when I was 10 years old, my parents became foster parents, and we had 67 different kids placed in our home mm. until I went to high school. So I've been around homeless people my entire life. Mm. It's not only in the States, but also on mission trips, of course, different places. And even as a student at DTS, I would walk to class and watch people walking down the street that were absolutely struggling and had nowhere else to go. Most churches weren't equipped or didn't understand how to meet needs of folks who whose needs are constant and ongoing. And so we were quickly drawn to meet the needs of those individuals, crawling under bridges, going behind liquor stores, deep in the woods, finding people that desperately need him. So, so that ministry involves, what do you actually do with the people that you work with? How does, that, how does your ministry work? Well, we serve about 1,600 people a week with six staff members and a lot of volunteers. We have a cafe near Fair Park where we have about 250 homeless folks a day come in to see us. And they come in honestly because they want a clean toilet and a hot cup of coffee and a shower and something to eat. But our primary focus is discipleship. So every day we have Bible studies and discipleship opportunities. We have a big brother, big sister program where you spend an hour a week really investing in someone's life. We focus on addiction recovery issues and, and obviously meeting real physical needs because people need coats and blankets and stuff. But we also go to about 150 other locations in Dallas County. So we go under every bridge, we go to crack houses, we go to places you can rent the room by the hour. We work with families living in their cars, people in absolute desperate situations that maybe have been there for 20, 30, or 50 years. A couple weeks ago, I took a guy to rehab for the first time, he was 86 years old. Mm. Uh, Friday, a woman came in domestic violence that every day a guy's been hurting her. I mean, every day it's a different story of someone who's living in absolute desperate need. Mm -hmm. And it's not just desperate need for a blanket and something to eat. They need the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they need the Lord to be delivered to them and discipled in a way that's contextual to their needs. That's a great ministry. Now, you do something that most people know a little bit about, a chaplain, chaplaincy. But what exactly is involved in a hospital chaplaincy? What do you spend the bulk of your time doing? We actually do several things. One of the things that we do is we go to visit the patients that have asked for us to come. That's one of the things. But we also respond to codes. We, and a code would be someone who's in respiratory distress or has their heart has stopped um, beating. Um, we deal with um, families that are dealing with death and withdrawal of life support. We also help uh, educate families on advanced care planning, medical power of attorney, living wills. Um, but there's really, and we also support our staff so there every day is different every day looks different and we go and meet the needs that are in front of us 
Now, I, I, will, I will ask for a shorter version of your story as well, if you can, <laughs> if you can do this. Uh, how did you end up being a Biblical Studies DTS mm -hmm. student and ending up at Baylor Hospital? Well, I actually started at DTS in 2001 and came through, and I don't know if anyone else has this story, but was felt called by God here, but wasn't quite sure what the calling was all about. And so I went through, started out in biblical counseling, and then went into the biblical studies program. Media arts was my background. Hi, Reg. <laughs> Hi, Reg. And um, so, so I was really trying to find what it was that God had called me to do. And I ended up um, stopping DTS, went and taught at two Christian uh, private schools because I'd been a teacher before, and I really didn't want to graduate and go back to what I'd been doing before. I really wanted to know what I was getting my degree for, make sure I was getting the right one. And I ended up going to Montana and did a church plant in Montana, and there was an opening for a chaplaincy program. It was interesting because I saw the when, when I first came, biblical counseling and uh, the chaplaincy program were very close, and I kept looking at it, and I look at marketplace chaplaincy, and I'm like, but it just didn't hit. But I went all the way to Montana and uh, fell into chaplaincy up there and fell absolutely in love with it because I've been praying, God, you made me, you, all my gift sets, all of my talents, you know what you want to do with it. I don't know. And when chaplaincy fell in my lap, I knew that was it. So you've been doing this now since 2009 at Baylor, is that right? Uh, actually at Baylor 2009, but started in Montana in 2007. Very good. And um, uh, there are a whole series of questions I want to ask both of you about, about how to minister in the context that you're talking about. So I'm going to start with you, Angela. Okay. You know, uh, I, I like, we, we did a podcast a, a few weeks ago that we released with Eva Bleeker in mm -hmm. which we talked about pastors go to hospitals all the time. Mm -hmm. They visit people uh, who are in need, who are, who are sick and in recovery and, and just need support. Uh, and yet, despite all the pastoral visitations that take place, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon from a pastor telling me as a parishioner what I ought to think about when I go to the hospital to visit mm -hmm. someone. My mom uh, mm -hmm. suffered through cancer when I was very young as a teenager. And going to the hospital for me is uh, a very, very traumatic thing because it always brings back all, that, all those memories and the, her suffering and that kind of thing. And I've always felt like it's a very awkward thing for people to do, to go to the hospital, to sit next, near someone who you know is hurting, and, and to just not know what to do. So I figure since you're a chaplain and you've done this more than once, that this is a chance to say to people who will end up having a ministry that will call on them to do this on a regular basis, what are the kinds of things you should, you should and shouldn't do when you visit someone in the hospital? How can you minister to them well? That's a great question. I think it, a lot of it just depends on the relationship that you have with that person, how much, um, how much permission you feel that you can make certain kind of relationships and speak into their lives. I would think that if you don't know them very well, going in and finding out what they might need. I mean, that's probably the question I ask the most is, what do you need, how can I help you? Because they'll know better. And if they don't know, then we can dialogue until we figure that out together. Um, I think the best thing that Job's friends did was sit in silence with him. The ministry of presence is so powerful to have someone just come and sit with you until something else needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that we saw our Lord com companion people that same way. I mean, he met physical needs a lot of times before he met spiritual needs. So sometimes it is a cup of water before you get to the sermon or the scripture. A lot of times it really is just sitting, holding hand, touch is so powerful. And a lot of times we, we get fearful of that, but if you let the Holy Spirit really guide you, you'll know what to do. And that's, I'm, that's, I'm a firm believer in that. So you don't go trying to, to, don't go with a sense of pressure, don't go with a sense that you need to fix anything. Your right. presence right there is really some of the most important ways you can, you can serve someone in that situation. Yeah, and just, just let the pressure roll off of you. It's not, I love not the not fixing piece. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Let the pressure roll off and know God has sent you there for a purpose and God will show you what that purpose is as you get there. And just show up, be present. Now, Wayne, a completely different side of the spectrum, and, and I suspect that for most people, doing what you do in the kind of ministry that you have is go, I have no idea how I'd even mm -hmm. think about how I'd think about this. How, if someone is, is drawn in the direction of doing the kind of thing that you're doing, what, what is possible? I mean, what, 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 and how would they start? How would, well, when you see the guy at the gas station who tells you he just needs three bucks because his car is broke down, his wife's stuck in it, they're trying to get back to Terrell, and we've all heard that story or one similar. 
or the guy with the sign on the street that says we'll work for food. That sign and that story is a misconstrued reality of his need, his deepest needs. Uh, and they're not going to be communicated well on a sign. And those needs cannot be met in a five minute conversation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can give somebody in a parking lot or behind a liquor store. There's nothing you can carry in your car. There's nothing you can carry in, even in our warehouse full of resources for the homeless. that's going to change a life reality. That person needs just what she said, someone that will get to know them by name, to listen with them. Job's friends did well till they opened their mouths, mm -hmm. and I believe it's the same. <laughs> For many of the homeless in Dallas, and we have we've have over 4,000 individuals that we've added to our system just in the last year, unique people, that we know them by name, and we get to hear their real stories, and we get to just close our mouth and open our ears, do the math. God gave us two ears and only one mouth, mm -hmm. and listen to people and get to know them. His name is not Cowboy. His name is Robert, and he served in Vietnam. And every time it thunders, he still jumps on the ground in, t in fear and terror. You know, this, this woman, I have a, we have a DTS uh, intern this semester, and the first time that they interact with the homeless, they, you know, their eyes turn into saucers, and they come back and, okay, tell me what they said. And um, He's teaching a Bible study, and I don't even know what the topic was. And he comes in and says, I don't know what to do because I've never heard anything like this before. We were talking about forgiveness, and this woman went into a story of how her earliest childhood memories is of one of her parents tying her and her sisters up mm. and horribly abusing each one of them in turn, mm. and then trading them to the neighbors for a case of beer. Mm. And those are things we never want to hear, we never want to say, we never want to record ourselves saying, but it's a reality that people live in that kind of hell every single day. And the last thing you can do is say, I know what you're going through. Just say this prayer. Just read this verse. Mm -hmm. Each one of us has struggled with sin and desperate pain in our lives. And the most important thing we need is someone who's not afraid to put their hand on us and pray for us. Mm -hmm. Not afraid to let us cry on their shoulder or cry with them and weep and mourn with them for what's going on in their lives. But it's only through a personal, long-term relationship where life change really happens. Mm -hmm. So if you show up in a Baylor hospital room, and we've all done it, we've mm -hmm. all been there with friends and family, if you don't know the guy and you show up, it's a different relationship than if it's someone you've known for a few years mm -hmm. and you're that friend that took off from work to be there. I've never regretted going to the hospital or sitting with a guy who's hurting under a bridge. I've always regretted not going. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got too busy that day and forgot to go, and now I've missed that opportunity. It's that long-term relationship where disciple-making and real comfort can come. So, um, by the way, the mics are up, so uh, if you want to ask your own question, feel free to step to the mics and we'll be glad to, to take the questions. So, what, what do you think is the mo most difficult obstacle that students have to overcome to develop a heart that, that if they don't have it, that, uh, that reaches out to those in need and, and particularly reaches out to those in need in a situation where you might be going, th they sense, this is a real stretch for me. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't know what to say and you won't know what to say. So we have to get over that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Apostle Paul, in I think in Ephesians 6, said, Pray that I may have the words to fearlessly express the mystery of the gospel. We are not going to know what to say to that person in that moment. Um, you, you're with a family who's hurting because their 16-year-old was in a horrible accident. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if he was the drunk driver or he was hit by one, you still don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. A woman comes in to see us who just found out that her AIDS is off the charts mm -hmm. and her hepatitis is causing problems with it and her diabetes is causing problems with it and she doesn't have long to live. You d will not w know what to say. Mm -hmm. Just like when a coworker walks in that may have been in a horrible accident that morning. And we have to get over the fact that we are not going to be prepared for every situation. We're not going to have that one big verse to pull out of our pocket that's going to fix the situation. We just need to close our mouth and trust the Lord and pray that the Spirit will use us in a way that's beyond our flesh. Kind of like in Acts 1-8 when Jesus said the Holy Spirit will empower us mm -hmm. to be a witness. It's that spirit leading us to minister to people beyond what our experience and our words have to offer. Now, Angela, same question for you. What do you, what do you think are the, are the ways in which you can kind of 
I, I think grow mm -hmm. out of out of perhaps limitations that you set for yourself in terms of ministry and being able to minister, particularly in context that y you walk in in your initial sense is this is terrifically uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I want to be in this situation. I think a lot of it is just moving from our head to our heart. Uh, a lot of times I think the uncomfortable uh, feeling comes from feeling like we have to be the expert, that we have to fix something, mm -hmm. um, or I've never been here before, I don't know what to do in this situation. I think the best thing that we learn in our chaplaincy training is acknowledge it, mm -hmm. become self-aware of it. Uh, if you try to act like it's not there, it will get in the way. If you can acknowledge it, then you can very often push through it, or you can use it and, and name it out loud when you're, you know, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. To be able to just say, this is really hard, this is really painful, and acknowledge what's really happening in the room instead of trying to make it better, because like you said, I mean, a lot of these situations, these are the worst days of many of these people's lives. So to be with them and to acknowledge that that difficulty, that tragedy for what it is, is powerful. Now this is gonna be a softball question, so I'm telling you ahead of time, and that is how hard is it to get involved, or how easy is it to get involved? I mean, what, what, what would you do to, to perhaps uh, do something you haven't considered doing before that, that might really make a difference in someone's life? Show up. That's real difficult. That's really difficult, yeah. just show up. You know, all the time we have, um, we have youth groups, we have senior citizens, we have high school kids that come, and if you're scared, I'll have some fifth graders hold your hand. You know, I mean, <laughs> we really have people of all ages that come and serve, and the biggest struggle is to get an individual just to show up. Take some time to really invest in someone's life and to be willing to be used by the Lord, to be a vessel, a, a tool in God's hand. Um, no, you're not equipped. No, you don't have the words to say. Maybe you've never been with someone who's homeless or, you know, you can't get over the fact that their life is a little bit dirtier than yours, uh, but you just have a, the capacity to cover up the sin in your life. Um, we had the capacity to get up and shave and look nice this morning, and they don't have that, and their spiritual well-being is dressed on the outside of them. So I think just showing up and be willing to, to step into a situation where you're also willing to be a part of something bigger than yourself. So if, if you go by yourself and crawl under a bridge, or you show up to, to someone in the hospital and you just say, you know what, I'm gonna be a chaplain today, and you just walk into a hospital ER, you're not connected to a bigger organization that is there to serve the needs of that individual every single day. Mm -hmm. So the homeless community in Dallas, for example, they call us, they call looking for us, they call begging, will you please come back to my camp? Uh, they want one of our people to visit them in the hospital or visit them under a bridge because they know us. And so I think the, the best thing you can do to get involved is just to connect and to show up and to give some of your time when you're willing to listen to someone. And often it's easier with a stranger, just like sharing the gospel, mm -hmm. than it is a family member. But there will be a day when you'll have the same situation with a family member. Mm -hmm. There will be that day when you get that call that someone's cousin, someone's brother, your sister, your child <coughs> is in that same situation. And you can learn so much on how to better handle that situation when you've done it through someone else's life than when your kid need re needs rehab than when your kid is in that accident. To really, to minister to other people teaches us how to be better stewards of our own family. So, um, so ha what kind of a time commitment are you talking about when you say show up? If someone were to say, I'm interested in doing this or, or stepping out and taking, taking the risk of, of, of showing up and doing something, what exactly, what, what kinds of opportunities exist in, in, your, in your ministry? Well, at our calling, we have opportunities eight days a week. You figure it out. I don't know how it works. <laughs> but we have opportunities where you could show up today. When we get finished here, show up over there and get a cup of coffee. Uh, our coffee's free. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um, you know, you could show up and just sit down with someone and have a cup of coffee with them, open up a chess set or a deck of cards or dominoes and just get to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And you try it and taste, take a, a taste test like at Costco and see if you like the thing and you want to show up for more. There's no long-term commitment. Sure, you could sign up to meet a same guy and really dig into his life week after week or lead a Bible study or be one of our pinch hit guys that'll show in and fill in for a Bible study when someone's sick. 
but even just showing up once every once in a while gives you an investment into the community where you will be oriented, you will be trained, you will be with our other folks who've been doing this for years before. We're not going to take you in the woods and drop you off behind a crack house, even though we do that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's a step-by-step -step incremental opportunity where you taste a piece and you say, you know what, I want a little more. Now, were you doing this while you were in seminary or is this something that happened after you left? Actually, yeah, we, I was a seminary student and about 2001, um, I was going crazy and with school and work and trying to stay married we and do that be a dad. You, huh? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I knew something had to give and uh, I really needed an outlet in ministry. So imagine this, a trade school where we learn how to build a car. Until you actually put wheels on the thing and push it down the hill, you do not know if you're learning anything. And it's so important, especially as we think of this QEP process, for students to be actively involved in ministry, even difficult ministry, while they are here, mm -hmm. to learn how to love well. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're not just going to graduate, get a degree, and become this person. Um, God is going to use you where you are today. And for many people, they may never get to the point where they get that degree. Uh, something, God may call them home before then. And so we get, need every opportunity after class to step out of the academics of theology from time to time and get into the practicality of how this applies in a real person's life today. Now, uh, Angela, let me ask you this. What do you think gets in the way of compassion and moving towards compassion? What, what, what obstacles do you see? Because obviously you deal with people on a regular basis and, and, and the chaplaincy is a, is a very emotionally demanding uh, ministry in many ways. You see people who are really at the edge. Um, uh, what, do you, what do you see as getting in the way of, of being able to be compassionate? I think a lot of it is having the lens on ourselves instead of on the other person. Mm -hmm. I think that's so much of it. And when we're looking at ourselves and we look at the other person, we feel the distance. But if we flip our lens around, then we really can be 100% focused on the other person. And stuff you would never imagine yourself doing as far as engagement just naturally comes out. So I think a lot of times judgment I think the biggest one is fear mm -hmm. for most of us is not knowing what to do, not knowing if we'll be able to handle it, mm -hmm. entering into those situations or that we'll mess up. So I think fear, um, judgment, you know, they're, no, they're not like me. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're from a different faith tradition. Maybe they're, I just don't know anything about their world. Uh, once again, I think it's the fear of messing up, the fear of doing something wrong that gets in our way of compassion. So how, how did you, you said you kind of fell into chaplaincy mm -hmm. while you were out in Montana. Uh, and you were wrestling with counseling and that kind of thing. Uh, how difficult or easy is it to be to move towards the chaplaincy? What is what does that actually involve? If someone had a sense of, you know, the opportunity to minister to people who are who are, who are in recovering from from trauma or from disease or whatever is something that that interests me. What is it? What is what does it take to get there? Well, I think a lot of it is what you just said, which is practicing on your friends practicing on the people that are in class with you because something happens every day on this campus and people's families and in their lives and um, I think that's the best place to start is right where you are like you said then also in your churches there are ministry opportunities for people to go and do visitations at churches I would say go try that try try that um, or be on a bereavement team of some sort uh, maybe a support group and help out with support groups if nothing else serving refreshments and just kind of being around it kind of depends on your comfortability level then also if you're wanting to go a little bit deeper than that you can volunteer at a hospital or at a nursing home or at a homeless shelter or at I mean, volunteering is a beautiful way to test the waters and not make a full-blown commitment. And then if you want to go even further than that, a lot of you are looking for internships. One of the best internships is clinical pastoral education. And actually, Rebecca Adrian is one of our supervisors at Baylor. She has information on that. If you want to, and we do it in one unit, you can do it in 10 weeks, you can do it in six months, or you can take a full year. But it's a great way to just get in there, really throw yourself into it, and see if it works or not. See if that's the right place for you to be. I promise you it'll make you a better pastor regardless of whether you're going to be a chaplain or not. Now, uh, Wayne, do you all at Our Calling connect to churches? How do you get your volunteers for your ministry? In 2013, we probably had 6,000 volunteers. Mm -hmm. And we had churches that drove from North Dakota to from Florida, from North Carolina. 
uh, as well as, of course, all over the Metroplex. We have people that come from all over that want to taste and see what the Lord's doing in the lives of homeless folks. And some of them um, want to really dig deep and invest. They want to bring their youth group or their small group. And some of them just want to tour of poverty. They want to see one, touch one, take their picture with one, and tweet it and say, look what I did. And we really feel that our mission is to disciple, make disciples on the streets. So that includes the homeless individual and the kid that comes down to serve the homeless individual to really teach them both how the Lord can use them both. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just invite and people come. Our spring break is already loaded. Our summer is already full with youth groups coming. Some will spend a night in our facility, um, take an experience of homelessness, sleeping in our parking lot in cardboard boxes, and then going and hitting the streets, serving folks. So we have churches from all over that come. Uh, and let me just talk about internships. Our internship program at Our Calling uh, gives a $500 a semester scholarship, I'm just saying, <laughs> um, for students that want to come. Because we recognize the need for students to come, and, but we also really want to bring students to that table and that place where they can really invest in the needs of the homeless community. Okay. I see uh, someone at the microphone, and we, we, we are, we're establishing a tradition here. You know, last podcast, I think it was, or two, our chapel, or two back, I think Dr. Bailey was at the mic, and now we've got Dr. Yarborough at the mic. So the rest of you faculty, get ready. Your time's coming. <laughs> and go ahead, Mark. I know it sounds like a question plant, but um, Wayne in particular, uh, first of all, thank you all, both of you, Angela and Wayne, for being here today and opening up and sharing what the Lord is doing uh, through your respective ministries. Uh, Wayne, you have been really involved in the QEP process, and on behalf of the seminary, we thank you for your contribution in that regard. Uh, you have both gone through our program, and as you reflect upon the QEP and what we are attempting to do with Dr. Bailey's announcement today, what are you most excited about? You've already been addressing this a little bit along the way, and I, I'm aware of that. But if you could boil it down to one thing for each of you, what would you say that you are most excited about to see where that will lead us educationally? Because that's what we're after. We're about uh, student learning. And there are many things that we do well here at Dallas Seminary, and Dr. Bailey alluded to that fact of other areas that we can develop in. But from your perspective as practitioners who have been through our program, what would you say is the one thing you're most excited about in regard to the coming of the QEP? You go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the application piece. Yes, finally, yes, that excites me. I remember being frustrated, being a frustrated student, going, what do I do with all of this? And to finally have some opportunities, to have all kinds of opportunities while you're still in school, to, to test that, to taste that, I think it's amazing. So please take advantage of it because I might not have had to gone all the way to Montana to figure it out for me. I'm excited about that for you, that you get a chance. So try something that feels very, very foreign and something very familiar and, and, and see what God wants to do with that. I think you'll be surprised, but thank you. Yay, that's exciting. Yeah, I think that we don't like to be out of our comfort zone and the QEP almost challenges that. It forces students to be involved in areas that they may not have ever seen themselves before. And so I look forward to the day when a QEP is not just a suggestion, but even a requirement. It's easy to sit on the back row, not answer the questions, and kind of slide in and out of class. But when you're required to be with someone who's really hurting and invest in their lives, and then to evaluate on that process and how the Lord is using, changing you in that, it really enables you to really evaluate this whole seminary experience and how the Lord is transforming you and using you to transform others. It really, again, puts those wheels on the ground, pushes it down the hill and tries to see if the wheels are going to fall off. How do I process this? Not after I've graduated and I've got to try to remember how to email my professor I haven't seen in two years, but when I go to class next week, hey, prof, I tried that and it didn't work. Or I tried that and it was awesome. Now, I appreciate the fact that we're not going to get emailed after we graduate, so that's a, that's a, that's a great relief. <laughs> Greg? Wayne, I just wanted to um, address two things usually that I encounter with a, with a homeless, and that is usually either fear or cynicism. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, fear that is this person on drugs and going to hurt me, or cynicism of this guy's just coming up and he's going to go to the liquor store and buy stuff. How would you address both those two things as we 
move toward the possibility of encountering with the homeless? Well, I think ministry in context. Um, if, if you were to go by yourself and go to some of the places that we regularly visit by yourself late at night, yeah, I would be f afraid. I don't do that either. Um, so we go in context with a big team that's qualified and trained. They've been doing this for years. Um, they know where to go. They know what to do. It's always a team of about 10 people that crawl under a bridge together. So fear is kind of out the door there. Um, because you're around people that are qualified. So for example, one of the people that leads one of our search and rescue teams, his name is Michael. Michael used to manufacture meth, got out of jail, was totally hungry and starving spiritually. Um, like the book of Amos says, there's a famine in the land for God's truth. He came into our calling to get a cup of coffee and now he's got a job. He's hiring other homeless guys to help him, but he's also going and reaching people with the word. He's discipling people. He's helping to lead Bible studies. And he, along with one of our other leaders of Search and Rescue, who's a grandmother, who on Saturdays, instead of baking brownies with her grandkids, is crawling under the bridges trying to find women that are hurting mm -hmm. and leading a team. Mm -hmm. That is a qualified group where fear is kind of out the door. You're not going by yourself. You're not Indiana Jones or the A-team, you know, trying to do this on your own. <laughs> but the second is, yes, Anytime you give somebody money on the streets, you are probably supporting their addiction. You wouldn't send money to a terrorist and hope they do something well with it. I prayed for the money. Uh, that is an individual who's struggling with an addiction. And every time you give them money, you are enabling that destructive habit. I would beg you not to every single time. Uh, if they need food, we want to feed them. Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. Not that you tossed two bucks out your window to appease your conscience. So I would say don't, because they probably are going to use it for destructive behaviors. Um, what would you suggest for those quick five-minute interactions that we have, rather than the long term? Like the guy who walks up to you, and how, what, what would be your suggestion on how to deal with that? Well, as far as a homeless individual, the first thing I would do is to recognize that I'm going to have those interactions in Dallas. I'm going to see homeless people. So I need to think about my answer before I walk up to the guy because he's going to walk up to me in a gas station. I would beg you to keep a stack of our cards in your pocket. We have these cards we give to the homeless that say, help, I'm homeless on it, and, and it has our phone number and our address on the back has a schedule of what we do. Keep a stack of those with you all the time to be prepared for those questions. The first thing you're going to do is really connect that person with an organization that is qualified to meet those needs. Because you understand you're asking the question because none of us really are by ourselves. The second thing I would do is just like with any other conversation when you're talking about the Lord, get to the main thing. The main thing is to keep the Lord the primary focus of all of our conversations. Yeah, you need a blanket, and that, yeah, you need a coat, and that, yeah, you need something to eat. So I would love to go to Jack in the Box. I'll buy you lunch if we can sit and talk, but I'm not going to give you any cash because I'd like to spend 30 minutes with you while you're eating that Jack in the Box and talk to, about the, talk to you about the Lord, tell you what he's done in my life, share with you my testimony, you know, and the Lord tells us the most valuable thing we have to offer people is our witness. We will be his witness. We will show the world what he has done in our lives to give an evidence of what he can do in theirs. What's, uh, what do you think you've learned by being a chaplain? Mm. I've learned about my own brokenness. I've learned that... Um, that God can use us no matter what we bring to the table as long as we make ourselves available. Um, I've learned that, and I, I thought that when I would be with people, one of the things that, that made me scared about being with people uh, in times of tragedy is I was afraid a lot of their bad would come out and that I wouldn't know how to deal with that. But actually, I'm amazed at how much good comes out in people when they are facing tragedy. Not all, but I'm amazed at how much good comes forth during those times. Um, I've learned to appreciate my life so much more and my family so much more. Um, that life and breath is so precious and that we take it for granted so often, but the things that used to really tick me off that were real little things are now little things. And that's been a, that's been a joy to get those things situated and changed in my life. And Wayne, same question. What do you think you've learned from the service that you've engaged in? I think I have learned that God is absolutely real and alive and active, and he transforms people. I have seen the wretch come to life again, 
not only in my own life, but I see that every day in the lives of other people. We see fruit every single day. We see women that used to be bought and sold who now are comforting women who walk in from the same situation. We see men that used to be the pimp or used to be the drug dealer who are now have come to the Lord, transformed a new creation, and now leading others to do the same. We see, I've seen God do things I didn't think were possible. You know, we want to measure our fear by our own inadequacy. In reality, God is the one that transforms people, and we're just a conduit for that. And I think if I've learned anything, it's that God is active and li alive in transforming people day after day, and we just get to be on the fly, a fly on the wall and watch it. Well, let's thank Angela and Wayne for being here today. And I, I hope you've got a, a little taste of what it is that we are hoping comes out of this emphasis that says, you know, I'm not just here to learn, and I'm not just here to learn stuff about the Bible. I'm actually here to let God go to work in shaping and forming me into the men and women of God he's called us to be, to live out the great commandment, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, and discover that neighbors are in surprising places and that ministry and change can happen through people who, who, who God brings into our lives who probably if we were designing it we never would have thought uh, I could have an impact and, and be impacted uh, by this person who, who God has brought in my path. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Father, we do um, come before you and just lift up um, ourselves as your servants. And we ask that you would teach us not just with words and not just with, uh, with verbs and grammar and syntax and backgrounds and debates and theological reflection, but that you would mold and shape our hearts. That you would mold and shape our hearts to be the men and women of God you created us to be. To be image bearers to people who also are image bearers to try and contribute uh, to a little bit of the restoration of the fall, which is actually why your son died, to bring back to creation what it was designed to be. Help us to do that well by how we love and serve others. Help us not only to teach truth, but to love not just well, but very well by your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.